Morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, Paolo will be here later today. So, uh, I just thought I'd put uh, up the list of posters that were at 10.30 this morning during the coffee break at the usual place. Um, and uh, so, hopefully, you've had a chance to have a quick look at the, the titles. And uh, now we'll get going with uh, Rafael's next talk. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we'll continue. So yesterday I uh, spent some time talking about the, the history of the CMB, why there was an expectation that one should see a, a cosmic microwave background, and I talked in uh, some amount of, of detail about the, the spectrum, why you expect it to be a black body spectrum, to what extent there might be departures from it. Today I'll finally talk about the small fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, so the departures from the 2.7255 uh, Kelvin black body radiation. And I'll start by talking about the, the kinematic uh, dipole. So uh, the first, if you say that there is a cosmic uh, microwave background or a black body uh, radiation around, then the first thing you have to check, and that's what we discussed yesterday, is that it's actually a black body. The second one is that it's unlikely that we're addressed with respect to that black body, and so you expect to see some, some dipole from our motion with respect to the cosmic microwave background, and that's what I'll uh, discuss. And then I'll say a little bit more about uh, things that you might see because of our motion. So there's also a kinematic quadrupole, and in principle, uh, octopole, hexadecopole, and, and so on. And there's also other effects that you can, lo uh, can look for, and they have even been measured. So you can look for aberration from our uh, motion and <coughs> uh, modulation in the, in the microwave background. And so after the discussion of what you see, the kind of effects you see in the microwave background from our motion, I'll finally discuss the, the intrinsic anisotropies. And then I'll briefly give, I mean, this you already saw in, in some of the other uh, talks, Enrico yesterday also introduced it, so I'll briefly uh, introduce the notation I'm using, which is fortunately roughly the same as Enrico was using for the, for the perturbations. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how to compute the angular power spectra. Today I'll just show you the relevant equations, and I won't really have time to show you the analytic solutions to them. We'll do that uh, at some later point. So this is what I'll uh, try to cover today. And uh, yesterday, today, so always feel free to, to interrupt me and, and ask me questions. If there's something that isn't clear, uh, just feel free to, to ask me at, at any time. So <clears throat> as I already said, so if you have a, a black body radiation around, this provides a reference frame. There's a clear notion of what it means to be at rest with, uh, with respect to the black body. This is when it has the characteristic black body spectrum. And so you can ask um, what happens if you're moving with respect to that frame. And uh, if you have, uh, the, we know the spectrum, we wrote it down yesterday. So for a black body at temperature T, you can work out, yesterday we wrote down the, the, spec, uh, the spectrum in the sense that I wrote down the number density of photons with frequencies between uh, nu and nu plus d nu. If you think about it in terms of a, a quantum field, uh, then you might, uh, let's say you put it at some, some finite volume. So in, in K space, you know there's a number of uh, harmonic oscillators so for, for different values of K. So this is, say, Kx, Ky, Kz. Or I'm calling it P up there, so let me call it P. E and P, and you have uh, harmonic oscillators that you can excite uh, everywhere. So this I'm sure everyone is uh, familiar with. And what I'm writing here is just the occupation number in, in this state for a given one of these oscillators, in particular the oscillator that's labeled by, the, by momentum P. So this is the occupation number, and if you want to understand uh, what happens when you boost, the occupation number is a useful thing because it doesn't really change. So it doesn't matter which way you look at the state. If you had uh, five photons uh, in, in this state, so in, at, at this, uh, this oscillator, if it had five photons before you boost, then it still has five photons after you boost. And so the occupation number is invariant uh, 
in the sense that the occupation number for the observer that's at rest with respect to the frame and the momentum that he labels by, uh, by the label P, this has to be the same as the occupation number that the boosted observer sees for the momentum for the same site here, but he will label it by, uh, in, by his own label, which is related to this label by a Lorentz transformation. So this is the, the transformation property for the occupation number. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so then. <clears throat> what you can do is uh, just relabel them. So you can, this is lambda p, so in the same way uh, you can just relabel them so you learn that uh, the occupation number that the boosted observer sees for the mode that he labels with P is the same as the occupation number the observer at rest sees for the mode that he labels as lambda inverse P. Okay, and so this uh, occupation number we know, we know what, it's, what the function is, so let's write it like this as, as four vectors. We know what this function is, and strictly speaking, it's only a function of the, the zero component of this. So this was only a function of the energies. And now, uh, what is this? So let's consider um, a boost uh, to, to a frame relative to the CMB. Um, with velocity beta, so then you know that the boost that does it, I mean, let's say for simplicity we'll assume that it's moving in the three direction and we'll, we'll fix that in a second. So let's say we're moving in the three direction, then you all know the boost by heart, I'm sure. So the boost in this case is gamma, zero, zero, minus beta gamma, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then minus beta gamma, 0, 0, gamma. And what we're interested in really is the lambda inverse, so you just take the inverse by flipping the signs, and so now the, the thing we're in, uh, interested in is this quantity, it's the zero component, and you see if you act with this on the, on the vector, E, P1, P2, P3. The zero component is gamma times E and then plus beta gamma, let me write it the other way, gamma beta P3. But this is just beta dotted into P, so this is really this quantity. And so you can simplify this slightly more. You can simplify this to write it as gamma times E times one plus beta dot P. So this is the, sorry, this is now the unit vector in that direction. So this is the lambda minus one P zero component that we need. And so now we can plug this into, into this formula. So you just get that N of lambda minus one P is one over, and then E to the, we just plug this uh, zero component in here. So it's gamma times E times one plus beta P hat over KT. This was the, the T zero minus one, and you see that this is uh, the same as a distribution with an effective temperature T as a function of uh, P hat. Uh, this is again the, the momentum of the photon you're looking at is equal to T zero divided by gamma one plus beta P hat. And then typically you expand this, uh, this out, so this is uh, T zero times one minus beta p hat. And then the, this is the momentum of the photon. If you see a momentum with photon in the p hat direction, you're looking in the minus n hat direction. So you get some plus n hat. So this is the temperature as a function of 
n hat. And you see that this gives you some dipole, but there are in principle higher order, higher order terms if you just keep going in the expansion. So this is what uh, we have. So this, uh, I think, hopefully makes sense to everyone. Yeah? Oh, I'm just expanding in small beta. So gamma is 1 over 1 minus, I mean, 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. So they're in principle there, but they appear at order beta squared. So these are the terms I'm dropping. OK, so this is the basic idea behind the, behind the kinematic dipole. And uh, this was pointed out a long time ago. So this is from 1968. It's a very uh, clear prediction. And uh, one more point. So the detectors that we have, they typically don't measure the, the temperature itself. Instead, what they're measuring is really the intensity of radiation that's hitting them. And so instead of the temperature field, you really want to do, this, uh, to do an expansion for the, for the intensity, but the intensity we had yesterday uh, was just 8 pi nu squared, well, i d nu, d nu over the, the black body spectrum, which we just computed. So you just expand it with respect to temperature, and you get a, a dipole modulation of the, of the intensity in this form. The only reason I'm pointing it out is because these fluctuations don't have a black body spectrum, so this is the black body spectrum. The perturbations always come with a derivative of the black body spectrum with respect to the temperature. So this is the, the only reason I'm pointing out this difference, because we'll see that if you were to go to higher orders, uh, you get second order derivatives and so on. So there's, in principle, a difference in the frequency, a different frequency dependence for the kinematic dipole, quadrupole, and, <clears throat> and so on. Okay, so this is something, obviously, once uh, you understand it's there, it's something you want to look for. And there were uh, a number of, of early measurements. The first measurement of the uh, right ascension was by uh, Ned Conklin, which I'm uh, showing you here. This was already in, in 1968. And uh, there were earlier ones that didn't really detect anything, so there were upper limits. This was the first detection of the right ascension, but not yet the declination. The declination, so you measure it fixed declination, and you're trying to measure the right ascension. You try to see where you have a, a peak, uh, and this was done in, in 69. Then the first measurement of the right ascension, declination, and the amplitude was done by uh, Paul Henry. So here you see the, the data. It's still obviously early days. Now we've measured with much higher uh, significance, obviously. But this was the, the first measurement of it. And all the numbers he gave for the right ascension, declination, and, and amplitude are still consistent with what we know about it today. You see that it's a, a single author paper. So he did everything uh, himself. He built the radiometer, put it on a balloon, launched the balloon, uh, collected the data, did the data analysis. There's some simple uh, foreground cleanings uh, in, a, in a way that's very similar to what we do in the analyses today. And then he was the, the one who wrote the paper. And the interesting thing about the paper is that this was uh, what he did for his PhD thesis. So this was his PhD thesis, the measurement of the dipole of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and then obviously as you go on, the measurements become uh, more and more precise. So there were measurements at higher significance. Again, some of them by the, the group at uh, Princeton. And then you probably have heard about the measurement uh, of the dipole by Smoot and collaborators. And here, I mean, this was measured from a, a, a U2 uh, spy plane. And these were actually the, the radiometers that were used on the, on the COBE DMR. So this was testing the DMR radiometers, and so here you see a, a picture of the, of the group, and here you see the measurements, so obviously much higher significance now than the, the previous measurements. So this is the, the history of the dipole, and now you might ask, well, how do you know that the dipole you're seeing is actually from our motion with respect to the cosmic microwave background, and it's not some intrinsic fluctuation? Uh, certainly the amplitude is quite large, so you don't expect this to be some primordial fluctuation, but that's some, some theoretical bias maybe, but there really are experimental ways of telling the difference between the 
uh, intrinsic dipole of the CMB and the, and the contribution from the motion with respect to the CMB because of the higher order terms that I, I didn't write earlier, but if you write it out and just go to next order in the expansion, then you find here the, the dipole piece. So these are the Legendre polynomials. So this is just the cosine that we had before. It's just the, uh, and then you have here, uh, the higher order pieces, which, as I said, involve uh, second order, uh, uh, second derivatives of the black body spectrum. And in principle, this is something that you can look for. This is not something uh, that has been measured, but you see that in principle here, the different frequency dependence allows you to disentangle the, the very uh, different pieces. It's been difficult to measure it because of uh, foregrounds that also introduce frequency dependence that deviate from, from what you naively uh, expect. So it's, it's not something that has been detected, but it is actually corrected for in all the CMB maps that people are using. There's a correction applied assuming that the measured dipole is a true dipole and then you correct for a, a small uh, kinematic quadrupole. Um, so there's additional effects. So this was the effect of our motion on the uh, monopole. Now I'll say a few words about the effects on the, the perturbation. So if you have a homogeneous bath of photons, you're moving with respect to it. The only thing you're seeing are these uh, dipole and, and quadrupole effects. If you have fluctuations in the microwave background, then there's additional effects. And you can again see them by doing these simple exercises. So the occupation number now is, uh, the, uh, depends also on the direction you're looking. So you have photons with different temperatures in different parts of the sky. This is what I'm indicating here by the T as a function of n hat. And then, as I said before, the n hat, so the direction in which you're looking, is, my, is the negative of the direction of the momentum of the, the photon. And uh, what you can uh, do is just, so this is the uh, fluctuations at, uh, or the occupation number in the, uh, at rest with respect to the CMB. Uh, but you can, again, uh, boost. So you do the, the same exercise, you apply a boost, and you find that the new temperature that you read off, so there's different pieces, so there's the piece from the zeroth order uh, part, so the zeroth order in the temperature, and then there's two, uh, two uh, new pieces, so there's a new piece uh, here, so you shift. If you're looking in the, in the direction n hat, and you're flying in this direction, you're not actually seeing uh, the radiation from that point, but you're seeing it from n hat minus the beta uh, perpendicular, perpendicular to, the, uh, uh, to this direction. And so, in other words, there's some, some uh, aberration. So you see the uh, fluctuation somewhat uh, boosted. This is the first effect, and then there's another effect which looks like something we had before, it looks like some, some form of a, a dipole, but it's different because you see it is a modulation in the amplitude of the, the temperature fluctuations. So you see that if you're boosted and you're looking in the, in the direction in which you're flying, the fluctuations are slightly larger than in the direction you're flying away from. So these are the two effects. So there's the aberration and then there's a modulation effect. And again, because this is uh, a second order piece, so you already had a, a derivative on this because it was a fluctuation, and then you have another uh, uh, derivative because you, it's, it's, you have this uh, beta, it has a characteristic frequency dependence, and you can look for these effects, and these are actually effects that Planck has detected. So these are, there's, paper, there's a, a nice paper uh, that you can read about this from the Planck collaboration. So this is the, the reference in case uh, anyone is interested. But so there's a number of uh, ways you can see that we're moving with respect to the cosmic microwave background, and they're all consistent. So we have a, a consistent picture. This, uh, these kind of uh, dipole effects are usually referred to as the, the solar dipole. There's another effect from the Earth moving around the sun, so there's a, a, an orbital dipole, and that's actually the one that's usually used to, to calibrate the maps, but uh, so 
So there's a number of these effects due to our motion from the cosmic microwave background that you can work out in, in very simple ways. So you can go through the, the same exercise and just boost this distribution and you'll see uh, these, these effects. And so in principle, uh, we can measure the, what are intrinsic fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background and what is, are the fluctuations from our motion with respect to the cosmic <coughs> microwave background. Are there any, any questions about the dipole? Yeah? Well, yesterday I was trying to argue that there are a number of uh, reactions going on in the early universe that, I mean, you also know from nuclear synthesis, as I was arguing, that the universe was very hot and dense early on. And in, in the very early universe, there are processes that both allow you to uh, change the, the number of photons. So you have double Compton scattering, you have Bremsstrahlung, and you also have processes that allow to, to change the energy, so you really have all these processes happening much more rapidly than the expansion rate of the universe, so you do expect to uh, get into thermal equilibrium. If you want, you can solve the, the kinetic equations and convince yourself, but you do end up in, in some um, uh, situation where you have a, a black body up to these small departures. So is that what you're asking? Or are you asking just let's forget about what happened very early on? How would we tell? I mean, one of the reasons I talked about these other effects is that you really uh, can uh, disentangle what's from the motion and what's from, from other effects. So that's why I was trying to show you a number of ways that you can see at what velocity we're moving, moving with respect to the CMB and they're consistent. So you can, on the one hand, you can measure this, uh, this dipole piece. This was the, the first one that was measured. This is the around three millikelvin, so it's quite large compared to the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, which are at the uh, 10 to the minus four level. So you can, you can look for this. This is something that's seen, and then in principle, uh, there's no reason if somehow this isn't due to the motion of us with respect to the cosmic microwave background that you should see relativistic aberration and modulation in, I mean, with a velocity that's consistent. It's, it's both the direction that you can measure and the, and the magnitude. So there's a number of independent ways you can measure our velocity with respect to the CMB. Um, so I, some of it, I would say, is some theoretical input that you expect the, in the early universe to have a, a black body spectrum. And if you have a black body spectrum, then you have some rest frame. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but... Preferred in what sense? So I, I don't know <laughs> who gets to decide what's preferred, but there is some frame in which the uh, spectrum or the occupation number of the cosmic microwave background will look like e to the e over kt minus 1 to, to good approximation. If we're forgetting the small 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 fluctuations, it looks like this in that frame, and there's no, no dipole. So in, in that sense, it's preferred, but it's, I think, the only sense in which it's preferred. Right, yeah, I mean, in, in addition, I mean, you could have argued that maybe the, yeah, so the, the one additional thing that I was trying to get across is that you could have argued that this dipole that you're seeing doesn't have to be due to the motion. Maybe there's just some intrinsic, some large intrinsic fluctuation in the temperature. Maybe the universe just intrinsically is a little hotter on that side and a little bit colder on that side. It's not something I can rule out just by making one measurement. The point is that from that measurement you can extract our velocity. I mean, you can assume that there is this rest frame. You extract our velocity with respect to the assumed rest frame from it. 
and then you check in other places that also have effect, I mean, show effects due to the motion, which are, in, for example, the uh, relativistic aberration, so some beaming of the, the CMB. Here you're making additional assumptions. You're assuming it's somehow Gaussian and you know what the pattern is, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. But there's the, the beaming effect and there's the modulation and the, the combination of these two gives you a, a dipole that's actually consistent with the dipole you get from just the, the kinematic dipole. So it's at least self-consistent. I mean, obviously there could be, in principle, some uh, the, 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 the additional point, I mean, you could also say, well, maybe someone just set up the fluctuations that way. Maybe there's some, some dipoles a little bit hotter here, a little bit colder here, and then the hot spots in the direction are moving are a little bit smaller than they are in the other direction. And in addition, they're a little bit hotter here than in the other direction. I mean, there could be such an initial condition, but it's a little bit awkward. And in addition, you wouldn't be able to set it up in a thermal process because the, this, the frequency dependence is actually wrong for that. So it's not just thermal fluctuations in that direction, but there's actually additional frequency dependence. Uh, it's, it's this function. So it's not the first derivative of the black body function. It's a higher order derivative. So in principle, at least there's some consistent picture. I don't know if some contrived way you can set it up, maybe, but it's at least a consistent picture. Yeah? Yeah? It, uh, yeah, it means that. I mean, if you, as you say, whenever there's a plasma or some, some thermal state, there is a preferred frame, which is the frame with respect to which, or in which this, this fluid is addressed. So there is that frame. So it's broken, not in, a, not in a terrible way. So I think when you talk about, this goes a little bit away from what I wanted to say, but if you talk about breaking of Lorentz invariance, there's different ways you could break Lorentz invariance. So you could break it at very short distances, and this is somewhat, this is the, the kind of breaking that's problematic and very strongly constrained. Or you could break it at long distances, let's say by, by the state, which you do here, by, by putting a, a chair in the room or by having a plasma in the room. So as soon as you have a, a state that's not the vacuum, you typically break uh, Lorentz invariance, but that's not a, not a problem. If you go to shorter and shorter distances, you see that the underlying theory is still Lorentz invariant. So that's the uh, the sense in which here Lorentz invariance, the, the theory does not violate Lorentz invariance, but the, the state you're considering certainly does. I mean, we do, when we write down the, the metric, I mean, there certainly is um, on, uh, on long distances when you write the S squared is minus dt squared plus A of t squared dx squared, then certainly Lorentz invariance is broken here if, if you're uh, interested in, in uh, lay, I mean, if you take into account the time evolution of this. But if you probe it on shorter and shorter distances, eventually you're not really seeing that this is time dependent anymore. I mean, in, in our universe, for example, we're, we're doing this all the time. I mean, we're usually, when we do field theory calculations, we use a Minkowski metric, I mean, for the, for the LHC. But you know that really there is a metric like this and there's some uh, let's say, the Sitter expansion from dark energy. There's some, uh, some expansion due to the Hubble expansion, and it's only if you probe physics on timescales much shorter than that that you don't care about it. So on, on short distances, you restore Lorentz invariance. On long distances, it's broken the same way in, in the early universe in the plasma. So also, also in the plasma, really in the same way. So if you look at processes that are much faster than the Hubble expansion, then you can use the usual Minkowski calculations. And in fact, that's typically what's done. So all the scattering rates that I was quoting yesterday did not take into account the expansion rate of the universe. You're always expanding, assuming that the individual scattering processes occur on timescales that are much shorter than the expansion rate of the universe. Okay, more questions? If not, then uh, uh, let's move on. So let's now uh, look at perturbations uh, beyond the, the dipole. So you take the maps that you get from, from the satellites that we'll discuss later, and you subtract off the effects that we were talking about. I mean, usually the aberration and modulation is not really something that's corrected for, but the uh, dipole and kinematic quadrupole are actually corrected for, and then you get some uh, 
uh, intensity, which depends now on the, the direction you're looking. And in principle, you can also have a polarization filter. And I'm indicating the orientation of the polarization filter by some, some function, uh, by some uh, uh, argument uh, psi here. And so it, the way you're defining the orientation can in principle depend on where you are in, in the sky or you can, uh, yeah, anyway. So there's some ambiguity in how you exactly define the coordinate system here, but let's, uh, in this direction, we can define an x and a z, and we can define an angle cosine theta that describes the, the angle in, in this plane in a particular direction. And then the intensity will, or the fluctuation in the intensity from the intrinsic fluctuations, it will have this first derivative from the black body spectrum, which sets the, the frequency dependence and then you will have uh, what we call the temperature fluctuations. So this is the piece that's independent of the modulation. Doesn't matter which way you orient your polarization filter. There's some component that you always see, and then there's something that's modulated. So there's some polarization in principle, and it's of this form. So there's a parameter that's called the Q, uh, Stokes Q parameter, and the Stokes U parameter and they come with a cosine of twice the angle and the sine of twice the angle. So this is the intensity breaks up in, in this way if, you, if you're trying to, to measure it. Does that make sense? So I'll be showing plots of the Q and U and temperature a lot, so if that doesn't make sense, you should slow me down and just ask me again. Okay, so if that makes sense to everyone, then uh, let's move on and uh, look at some of the maps. So uh, this is really the kind of data you get out of WMAP, Planck, or the, the CMB experiments. What they give you are the maps for delta T, which is convert. So really what's measured is the intensity, but it's the first thing they do is to convert it by multiplying or dividing by, by this factor. This isn't, strictly speaking, maybe quite what you want to do unless you're actually looking at the CMB, but everyone understands that that's the convention. The reason maybe it's not what you exactly want to do is because there's also foregrounds which have a very different spectrum, but it doesn't matter because it's just some constant you're multiplying the maps by and you can undo this. But so typically, at least for the frequencies below 353 gigahertz, Planck gave you the, these uh, temperature maps and then the maps of Stokes Q and then I'm not showing Stokes U, but it looks similar to, to the Stokes Q parameter for the, for the Planck measurement. So there's these kind of maps you get, and then they indicate where the intensity is higher or the temperature is higher. You see along the galactic plane, obviously it's higher. And then you also see that in the CMB, there's these intrinsic fluctuations for uh, some, uh, some parts that are a little hotter and some parts that are a little colder. There's the, the cold spot, and I don't know, there's Stephen Hawking's initials somewhere here along the uh, galactic plane. So in any way, these are the, the maps you get from the experiments, and we don't usually... Uh, so in, if you do a, a theoretical calculation, you cannot really predict what the map should look like. You can only predict its statistical properties. So what you want to compute are the, the correlation function. So you want to uh, compute what is the, the correlation between a temperature uh, fluctuation in this direction. If it's high here, how likely is it that it's high also in, in that direction? Uh, similarly, you can correlate the temperature fluctuations with the Stokes parameters or the Stokes parameters with themselves. And then, of course, you can also look at higher order correlations. So you try to, it's a little bit difficult with the two arms, but in principle, you can correlate three points in the, in the, in the maps. Now, this is still not what's usually done. So for data analysis, uh, it's usually uh, more convenient to use multiple coefficients. These are the ALMs uh, uh, that you've probably seen before. So what you have is delta T is a function on the two sphere. So the, the natural thing you do in, uh, in physics when you have functions on the, on the two sphere, you just say, well, I can expand them in terms of uh, spherical harmonics, which are the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the two sphere. So you can write ALM Y L M uh, of uh, uh, of n hat, 
And here I'm just integrating this against uh, another YLM to get the ALM out. So I'm sure you've seen these kind of things before. So you have these multiple coefficients for temperature. And then similarly for polarization, you can expand the Stokes Q and U parameters, except in this case, they're not really functions on the, uh, on the two sphere, but they are components of a symmetric two tensor on the, on the two sphere. And so you should expand them not in terms of the spherical harmonics, but in terms of what are known as spin two spherical harmonics. So these are the eigensections of the um, Laplacian acting on these, uh, on these uh, symmetric two tensors. But otherwise, the, conceptually, it's the, the same thing. So you just take the map Q of n hat plus I U of n hat, and you decompose it in some other uh, set of special functions. So this was A T, and this is A P L M, and these are the spin two spherical harmonics of n hat. And then they're again or, uh, orthonormal, so you can just extract the APLMs by integrating against the spherical harmonics. And uh, typically, so the temperature multiple coefficients are the ones we're actually using. These ones are not typically used because they don't have nice transformation properties under parity. Uh, to fix that, what you can do is define new uh, linear combinations of them, uh, which are called E and B because of their parity uh, trans properties under, uh, of the, uh, under, well, because of their transformation properties under, under parity. So AELM, which I'm defining here, transforms in this way. So it goes like minus one to the L times AELM. And this is uh, how an electric field would transform or a, or a gradient. So this would be like a, a gradient of a, of a scalar field would transform in that way. And we'll see later that that's relevant. And then for A, uh, B, L, M, uh, these are, uh, they have an additional minus sign uh, under, under parity. And so they transform like a, a B field, if you wish. So that's why they're called E and, and B modes. And they essentially correspond to a, to a curl. Okay, so what you then do, instead of computing the correlation functions, you actually compute the, what are known as the angular power spectra. So you look at the you, um, uh, A LM, uh, A star LM, and you take an ensemble average, so you uh, average here over all possible realizations, and then the wigner eckert theorem tells you that it has to be uh, of this form. The ensemble average has to be of this form to respect rotational invariance, so it has to be uh, independent of M and proportional to delta M and prime. And it can depend on, on L, but has to be diagonal in L. And this is true for, for all of them. And you just define the temperature angular power spectrum as the ensemble average of the TT and the TE uh, cross spectrum as the ensemble average of TE, uh, EE, uh, uh, and BB, just like they're here. Um, so if your, if your theory is Gaussian, uh, then all the correlation functions are encoded in the correlations in the, in the two-point function. Uh, the two-point functions are defined here. And then if you're interested in higher endpoint functions, you know that in a Gaussian theory, the odd endpoint functions vanish. And the even endpoint functions are given by sums of products of the two-point uh, uh, correlation functions. And so this is really all the information that you need to specify the uh, statistical properties of the fluctuations in a Gaussian universe. And so far, uh, we don't have any uh, departures uh, from that, at least in, for, in a, from primordial non-Gaussianity. There are non-Gaussianities from uh, late time evolution, obviously. So these uh, so these are the things that can be calculated, and we'll see how you calculate them later on. Um, you can also measure them from the sky. So these angular power spectra are really how you make contact between the, the theory and the, the measurement. Now, how do you measure them? You take the, the map. We'll, we'll see it in more detail in the, in the next lecture, but you, you take the map, and you decompose it. You compute the ALMs, and then this is somewhat schematic. This is only true if you had a, a full sky map. But if you have a full sky map, you just take these numbers 
take the absolute value squared and average it over m, and this is the, an estimator for the angular power spectrum, uh, for the observed angular power spectrum. And um, there's two things that one maybe should point out for these estimators. So as I already said, this is a, a somewhat simplified version, and it assumes that you have full sky maps. In practice, you, typically, you basically never have full sky maps because you have to at least cut out the galactic plane and point sources, but it's known how to, to correct for it, so we'll see a somewhat uh, more complicated version of this at some, some later point. Um, uh, one thing that's uh, interesting about this estimator is that it's unbiased, so if you uh, take, uh, if you do a, a number, if you do a simulation, so you simulate what a sky would look like, and then from that sky, you do a measurement, and then you average over many simulations, then it returns for you the, the angular power spectrum that you fed in. So it's not necessarily true that this is uh, true realization by realization, but statistically, you recover the, the angular power spectrum that you started with if you average over different realizations. So it's unbiased in this sense. Um, uh, but there is cosmic variance. So if you compute the, the variance, um, then uh, you, uh, so you compute uh, for each realization, you measure the CLs in, in the way that's described here, and then you subtract the theory spectrum that you fed in and, and square it. If you average this over all possible realizations, you get something that's non-zero. So this is known as uh, cosmic variance, and it's, it's uh, always two over the, the number of, uh, of modes uh, times the uh, square of the, the initial power spectrum. So these are the two properties, and these are usually also shown in some of the plots as gray bands to indicate the, the cosmic variance. So this is just uh, something you have to pay attention to because we're only observing the, the sky once, so we can't really average over it. We're only observing it once, so it's likely that we're not uh, measuring exactly the underlying angular power spectrum, but something that's a small I mean, some fluctuation away from it, and this tells you how far away you might have fluctuated. Okay, so uh, now we'll uh, uh, look at some of the early measurements of the, unless there's questions about it. So if there's questions about, uh, are there questions about this part? Maybe I should ask. Yeah? So I'm, I'm saying you have a theory that predicts for you the CTTL. Yeah, this is a, a theoretical part. So here, when I'm writing this, what I, what I have in mind is that you have some, some theory. So we have a, a theory. And it predicts for you some CTT, L. We'll, we'll see how we get there from some inflationary model or from some model. Uh, of uh, initial conditions plus uh, physics of the baryon photon plasma, we can compute this. And then now what I'm saying is uh, that in principle, from this theory, you can uh, simulate. So you do, so obviously we're only looking at one such simulation, but to understand what this ensemble average is, is you're really averaging over many different realizations. So you have a theory, and then it gives you some realization of the sky. So you get some ATLM. So this is, let's say, the, the first simulation or something like this. And um, from this simulation, uh, you can measure the angular power spectrum in, in this simulation. So for the first simulation, you measure some angular power spectrum, which is 1 over 2L plus 1, sum over M, ATLM, 1, absolute value squared, and this is the analog of what I'm calling uh, observed here. So you do this, and then you do this for the, for the second simulation, A2, and so on. So you have a bunch of uh, CLs. So you have the C, I, uh, T, T, observed. And then for each of them, uh, you can calculate this quantity, so there's some departure of the one you measured in your simulation from the, the true underlying power spectrum, and I'm saying you uh, square this and then average this over the, the simulations, and then you should find this, this kind of quantity. 
And it's something you can uh, show fairly easily analytically, actually. So if you, uh, I didn't want to go through the, the exercise, but we can go through the, through the exercise later if you're interested. But if you just take this estimator, so you say you have an estimator, C, T, T, L, that is 1 over 2L plus 1 sum over M, A, T, L, M uh, squared. And now, so this is the, the estimator, and then there's some, some average CL. So there's C, T, T, L is the average of the uh, CL hats. And you can analytically, using the properties of these, namely a T L M A star T L prime M prime is equal to C L uh, delta L L prime delta M M prime. You can use this and this definition to derive this if you want. So, but this is this was in any case the idea. Yeah. The two factor comes because you have two ways of, of contracting. So if you look at the uh, at this correlation, there will be four A's everywhere. So you're squaring this. So there will be ALM, ALM, and then you can the um, the uh, the disconnected piece goes away. This is what you're subtracting here. This subtracts out the disconnected piece, and the, for the connected piece, you can have so you have four A's, A A A. A, you, so the, the connected piece, the disconnected piece. So this one goes away. You're subtracting that with the with the rest, and then there are the two uh, uh, connected pieces. And here, each one of them has a delta l l prime. So you kill one of the sums. So in the square, you have two sums, and each one of them kills one of them. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, more questions? Yeah? At l so this is the large uncertainty on large angular scales at low L. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. I mean, it's still, so the CMB measurements right now of Planck in the temperature power spectrum is uh, signal to noise uh, larger than uh, one out to maybe L of 1500, L of 1800 or so. So you, you are sensitive to this out to fairly large L. I mean, you just measured it so well. The noise is so small by now that you are sensitive out to fairly small, uh, fa fairly small angular scales. Uh, but yeah, certainly it's, it's very small. So if you, if you look at it in the plots, it's clear that the cosmic variance just blows up on, on large angular scales. And that's why we're typically discussing it because we just have a lot of modes out there. But in, in principle, this is still a, a contribution to the, to the error bars. Sure. In different frequencies, but there shouldn't, if it's true that it's a black body, then there should, well, if you're assuming that there's no foregrounds, let's, let's ignore foregrounds for a second, but then there's no additional information if you measure it at different frequencies because you're just looking at the same, same spectrum at different, different parts of the spectrum. So we had the spectrum, which was e to the h nu over kt minus one. If you know that at one frequency, you know it everywhere. If you know the, the temperature and you've measured it at one frequency, you know the spectrum everywhere. So there's no additional information in, in that sense. Uh, is that what you're, what you're asking? I mean, it's the, the perturbations, again, are proportional to the derivative of this, but that's the same, same argument. I mean, you know the spectral dependence, and if you assume that that's your spectral dependence and you know the temperature, you measured it at one place, uh, then it's, it's fixed. With foregrounds, obviously, this is no longer true because then the foregrounds have different frequency dependence from the, from the cosmic microwave background, and that's why we do measure it at many frequencies. I mean, Planck, for example, measured it at nine frequencies. Make sense? Yeah? 
for now, I'm assuming that the CMB is Gaussian, yeah. And it's a, a good approximation in the sense that we don't have departures from Gaussianity from, from primordial physics in any case. So there are some effects that uh, introduce non-Gaussianity, but not, not at the level I'm, I'm discussing. I mean, yeah, but here I'm assuming it's Gaussian. And I think Enrico will explain to us why we expect it to be at least close to Gaussian. Okay, so now let's look again at some of the old measurements. And one of the old measurements that uh, is from the uh, relict uh, satellite. So this was a, a measurement uh, that actually uh, claims to have detected the, the quadrupole. Um, it's sometimes, or it's not always quoted. I'm not totally sure if this is just a, a cultural thing that uh, people from uh, Europe and uh, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm not sure why it's not uh, mentioned more. This is a Russian experiment. One objective criticism you might have is that it was a measurement at a single frequency. So if you see fluctuations in, at a single frequency, you may be not entirely sure if it's foregrounds or not. But this, this was discussed, and so this is the, the claimed first detection of the quadrupole. The measurement of the quadrupole and higher order multiple moments that everyone is familiar with obviously comes from the uh, COBE uh, spacecraft and in particular for the DMR experiment on COBE that was led by, by Smoot and that's the experiment that he uh, got the Nobel Prize for and here you see the, the map, the COBE map and we'll see how the, the maps evolve. I mean this is at relatively uh, low resolution compared to what we now have but this was the first measurement of the fluctuations and it gave a quite low uh, quadrupole and we're still stuck with a quite low value of the quadrupole. So then from there on, this was a space mission, from there on there were a number of experiments. So here the black dots I should say are the COBE power spectrum, COBE angular power spectrum um, out to uh, L of about 30 and then the uh, additional experiments from the ground started measuring on, on smaller scales and uh, at this time it wasn't yet clear really what generated the initial perturbations and one of the theories at the time was that the perturbations that have to be there, oh, we know that there had to be perturbations because otherwise we wouldn't have stars and galaxies around us but one of the theories at the time was uh, that uh, the perturbations might have been generated causally, there's certainly a a nice, uh, nice idea, might have been generated causally by, by strings and monopoles, and then you see the prediction of these models, and at the time the statement was that the data does not favor these models. I think it's fair to say that if you take the data here seriously, it's already ruling out uh, these models. These experiments are uh, Matt, Toko, Saskatoon, so they're also experiments that are not usually credited all that much, but here you're seeing the, the first evidence for the uh, first acoustic peak and then the experiment that everyone knows from uh, a few years later is the combination of boomerang and maxima which really had a, a nice measurement of a first and second and maybe third, I mean this may be a little too ambitious but certainly the first two uh, acoustic peaks from, from boomerang and maxima from, from 2001. And then as you fast forward, so I don't want to go through all the experiments, but as you fast forward to WMAP9, so this is the nine-year WMAP data, you see how the measurements really quite uh, rapidly uh, become uh, better and better. And you see, you clearly see the first three peaks. And here the gray band is what I was mentioning earlier. The, so the gray band indicates the, the cosmic variance that we were discussing. So you see that it's, it's dominating on large scales, as you would expect, because it goes like uh, 1 over 2L plus 1. And then uh, here you see the measurement that uh, Enrico yesterday was referring to, or the sign of the TE cross correlations. You see this negative sign, uh, which really uh, tells us uh, that these, these perturbations were generated even before the universe was first filled with a, with a hot and dense plasma. So there was some process uh, early on that generated these perturbations and we're seeing these uh, adiabatic perturbations today in the, in the CMB. Uh, and the, the reason you cannot draw 
too much of a conclusion from the temperature perturbations, as we'll see later, is that temperature perturbations can be generated at later times as well, whereas polarization you can only generate when there's free electrons around, which happens at reionization, but that uh, only contributes at large angular scales and then during recombination. So here really getting a measurement of the velocity potential, as Enrico was also showing, uh, from, the, uh, from the CMB in a fairly model-independent way. And then here, uh, five years later, are the, the measurements from Planck, and you now see seven acoustic peaks. So it's a very nice, nice measurement. And in what follows, I'll describe how or the underlying equations that are being solved, how to compute the angular power spectrum. And in the next lecture, I'll say a little bit more about how these angular spectra are actually measured. So you will see from, from both sides what this plot is showing. So eventually, we'll try to understand the lambda CDM prediction that's shown here in red. And we'll try to understand where the, where the blue dots come from. OK, to understand how to compute the angular power spectrum, we have to go back and do some uh, more uh, perturbation theory, general relativity perturbation theory. And uh, what we've seen before was uh, for the homogeneous case, we had a, a line element of this form, so minus dt squared plus a squared dx squared, and then a stress tensor that had a, a 0, 0 component which uh, is, the, is measuring the energy density, and then uh, uh, a spatial component that's measuring the, the pressure. You have some, some perfect fluid. If we uh, now want to describe the, the perturbations, you have to do perturbation theory around the solution in, in general relativity. Enrico already discussed it, so this will be uh, somewhat brief. But what you do is you just perturb the metric. So you write the metric as the, the background metric plus fluctuations, which I'm writing as H00, H0i, and Hij. And then in a similar way, you perturb the, the, ener the, the stress energy tensor. So you have some perturbations to the energy density. You have some delta T0i. And you have some, some perturbation to the, to the spatial part. And uh, Enrico went through this, so I, I, I will just show it. But under an infinitesimal coordinate transformation, so you send x to x plus epsilon mu of x, you can show that the, the metric perturbations transform in this way. So there's the 0, 0 perturbation of the metric shifts uh, by the time derivative of the 0 component of, uh, of epsilon. And then you have these transformation properties for the 0i component, the ij component. This tells you that you can uh, gauge some of these away. So you can use the epsilon 0, for example, to gauge h00 away. Then this is something that's fixed, but you can use then epsilon i to gauge uh, h0i, at least the, the scalar part, to 0. This is what's called the uh, synchronous gauge. And that's what I'll be, uh, I'll be using. There's a, yeah, so this is the, the gauge uh, that I'll be using. And Rico will probably use different gauges, but you're just really changing, uh, changing coordinates. So there's nothing, I mean, obviously in, in detail, changing gauges and so on can be tedious. And using one gauge rather than another gauge can be very convenient. But conceptually, there's nothing, nothing deep about it. So you just change your, your slicing and change the coordinates on the, on the slices. So in synchronous gauge, then if you gauge away the 0, 0 perturbation and the 0, i perturbation, the line element just looks like this. It's nice and simple. And the, the perturbation to the stress tensor has a piece that's the perturbation to the, uh, to the energy density. And then you have a, a, a velocity uh, of the perturbation to the velocity, for velocity of the fluid. And then you have a perturbation to the pressure, uh, some the remaining metric perturbation. And then there's something that's referred to as anisotropic stress. Um, I don't think I'll say too much about the anisotropic stress, but in, in principle, it's something that's there. It's, it's relevant for relativistic degrees of freedom like neutrinos, degrees of freedom that free stream. In principle, in the equations, it's also there for the, for the photons. Um, and so, uh, as Enrico already discussed, you can decompose the perturbations into scalar, vector, and tensor perturbations. So for example, the uh, perturbation to the, to the velocity, you can write as a, a derivative of a velocity potential 
plus something that's uh, a transverse, so di of delta ui is zero. And similarly, you can decompose the uh, spatial part of the metric in terms of a perturbation to the trace. And then uh, di dj times b something again with a vector that's, that's transverse. And then the transverse traceless gravitons. So this is the way you can decompose them. And at linear order, they really, because of rotational invariance, they don't mix. Uh, the same decomposition works for the anisotropic stress. And I'll mostly be interested for now in the, the scalar perturbations. So these are the, the perturbations in the, the energy density uh, in, the, in the plasma. These are the ones that we were looking at for the temperature um, perturbations and for the TE cross spectra. Obviously, later on, we'll be interested in the, the tensor perturbations or the primordial gravitational waves that you can look for in the CMB through the, the, polar, the B mode polarization. OK, so yeah, so as I, I already said this, Enrico said it, so I don't have to spend time on it. But rotational invariance guarantees that these don't mix, and you can just look at the scalar sector separately, the vector sector separately, the tensor sector separately. Um, and the uh, vectors, um, if they're not sourced, they rapidly decay. So usually uh, in, in inflation, we won't really talk about the vector perturbations. We talk about the scalar perturbations uh, and the, the tensor perturbations. Um, now, one point that I briefly mentioned earlier, and this is something one can do, obviously, in a more rigorous way, but earlier I said the transformation properties of AELM correspond to a gradient. The transformation properties of the ABLMs correspond to a, to a curl. The, you cannot really make a, a curl at linear order perturbation theory out of a scalar, so there's no ABLM in the... In a, in a theory that has only scalar perturbations. And so the scalar modes really only generate temperature, anisotropies, TE cross correlation, and EE power, while the vector modes and tensor modes generate, in addition to that, also uh, B modes. And so the, the vectors, as I said, they decay, so we won't really talk about them anymore. But the, this, uh, this simple fact, following from the transformation properties uh, of the E and B modes, tells you that if you see uh, a B-mode polarization, you're actually looking at uh, tensor modes, in, at least in the context of inflation. It changes if you have something that sources them, like cosmic strings and so on. OK, so now let's look at the equations that we have to, to solve to compute the angular power spectra. And to work them out, we have to first figure out when we should begin our calculation. And yesterday, I already mentioned that I'll really be interested in temperatures below 10 to the 9 Kelvin. So for the most, uh, everything, uh, or most things happen in, in thermal equilibrium. And we're, uh, certainly for the, for the CMB, at temperatures above 10 to the uh, 6 Kelvin, we have a, a nice black body spectrum. And so we should start above 10 to the 6, but not at temperatures too high that makes our life difficult. So we'll start at temperatures that are low enough so electrons and positrons have disappeared. And all we have in the universe are some helium nuclei, protons, electrons, photons that mediate the interactions in the, in the plasma, the neutrinos, maybe a cosmological constant or dark energy, but this is mostly relevant at, at late times, and then uh, at dark matter. So this is, we'll start just below 10 to the 9 Kelvin, and with this matter content. So we'll try to write down the equations of motion that describe the universe from 10 to the 9 Kelvin to the present with this matter content and use them to compute the angular power spectra. Uh, does that make sense? OK. So then um, for the electrons and protons, uh, we know that they, they scatter very efficiently, and we, we can describe them as the, uh, as the baryon fluid. Uh, so this is what I'll call baryons, even though electrons clearly are not baryons, but in, in cosmology, electrons are part of the, the baryons. Uh, for cold dark matter, because it's very non-relativistic, uh, you can also describe it in a, in a hydrodynamic way. You just have to keep track of the, the energy conservation. Um, for the neutrinos, because they, they're uh, very light, uh, they, they free stream and have anisotropic stress. 
And so we usually describe them by a Boltzmann hierarchy. And I'll, I'll introduce this thing uh, next. And uh, for the photons, certainly if we want to keep track of their polarization, uh, which we do want to keep track of because we're trying to compute the E, CLEE, -E, CLTE, -E, so the, the power in, in polarization, then we also have to describe them by a, a Boltzmann hierarchy. And so I'll try to go through uh, those, uh, those equations. So before, I don't want to write down the, the full equations right away because they look uh, a little frightening maybe if you haven't seen them before. So it's some, some lar large-ish system of equations. So instead what I want to do is look at a somewhat simplified toy model. So we're imagining having some uh, ma a gas of, of massless particles. Uh, it's thermal. And uh, f so the only simplification I'm doing here, or there's a number of simplifications. So first of all, I'll work in flat space. For now, I will not take into account the expansion of the universe. And for now, I'll ignore the, the helicity of the photons. So I only uh, essentially describe a, a scalar particle. And so instead of keeping track of all the uh, particles, what you want to do is you want to describe them in terms you want to coarse grain the system and describe them in terms of the, the phase space density. So the, the phase space density uh, looks like this. So you're just summing over all the particles and have a, a bunch of uh, delta functions where the particle is localized and where uh, its momentum is. So this is completely classical, obviously. So, but, uh, so we, we have this, uh, this phase space density. And then what we're trying to understand is what is the equation of motion this satisfies. We know what the equations of motion of our particles are. If you have a, a particle uh, that's, so these are massless, so they're moving at the speed of light. So dx by dt is just the direction of the, the momentum. And there's no, if we assume there's no forces, no collisions, then, uh, then we just have the momentum conserved. So it's just a bunch of free particles that, uh, okay, just a bunch of free particles. And so the question is, what's the equation they, they satisfy? And it's easy to, actually, if I only have five minutes, maybe I should ask for questions instead, because. Yeah, okay. Well, it's just that I'm starting something new in a sense, so I'm saying uh, either way. So I can, I don't know if there's any, any preference. If there's questions, you can ask questions. Otherwise, we'll look at this for a little while longer maybe. But we'll, okay, well, maybe let's try to get to the, through the flat space uh, part and then generalize it after the, in the next lecture. All right, so what you can do is from this, from this phase space density, you can compute dn uh, by dt, the partial derivative uh, with, respect to the, uh, with respect to time. And then you see that it will act on, on this thing here. And this, uh, so if you have the sum over r, and then the derivative of this uh, with respect to the uh, uh, acting on the delta function that has the momenta just is zero, so the only piece you have to worry about is this piece, and you get a, uh, a derivative acting on uh, the, uh, on the, uh, so, so this is, well, d by dxr, dxr by dt of the, the delta function, and then d by dxr, I can trade for a minus d by dx, which I can pull out. And here's the delta. So this is x minus xr, t minus pr of t. And then this is just the, the direction of p hat r. So this is minus d by dx sum over r and it's pr hat times delta x minus xr delta of p minus pr 
of t. And so this, again, because of the delta function, I can set equal to p. And so this is minus p hat dot the, the gradient of n. Once I pull it out, I just get the phase space density again, and I get some collisionless Boltzmann equation that's satisfied by the, by the phase space density. And so as for the, for the photons, so we should keep in mind the, the photons, obviously, we shouldn't just study this system. But as for the photons, the intensity and the, the temperature are related in, in this way. So the temperature perturbations are related to the intensity perturbations, again, just by doing a Taylor expansion of the, the intensity. And so if you imagine doing a measurement that measures the intensity perturbations over the whole range of frequencies, then you can convince yourself that the integral over delta i nu is just 4 delta t over t times the integral over the intensity. And this should be clear because what you're, in, what you're computing here, so you know that rho uh, with, uh, for, the, uh, for the gas, it goes like the temperature to the fourth power. And so if you compute delta rho over rho, this is just 4 uh, delta t over t, so this is what I'm uh, essentially writing here. And so this is the quantity we're interested in, and so it's, it's natural to define uh, this, this object. So this is the perturbation to the intensity, so this is the perturbation away from the thermal distribution for my, for my gas of particles, and I'm uh, integrating over all the frequencies, so I multiply by another p to get the intensity from the number density, and I, have, I keep track of the direction. So this is the uh, temperature perturbation, if you want, or the perturbation to the intensity at some position x in this, in this gas, uh, for a contrib and the contribution for particles with momenta in the p hat direction. Or if you have a device there, then again, it would be more natural to replace this by, uh, by minus n hat. So you might want to know what's the, the temperature perturbation in the gas looking at, at some point if you look in the n hat direction. So this is what this, uh, this quantity measures. And so instead of the, the Boltzmann equation for the phase space density, we'll now be interested in deriving an equation of motion for, the, for, this, uh, for this quantity. And it's very easy because it just inherits the, its equation of motion from, uh, the, from the Boltzmann equation. I mean, if, if you do a perturbation theory, you just uh, put deltas here. So this is the uh, equation that you, that you get. So the, the delta satisfies that same, uh, same equation. And you have an equation of motion for the, uh, for the temperature perturbation uh, at a position con uh, x in, in the direction uh, p hat that looks like this. So you get a, an equation of motion uh, that looks like this. And now what you see is that this equation is translationally invariant. This is something that Enrico already also explained to you that if you have translate, and you probably know it anyway, but if you have a, an equation that's translationally invariant, and it's linear, then it's very convenient to look for Fourier solutions because it diagonalizes this, uh, this operator. And uh, in particular, so what we're doing now is we're taking a, a, a superposition in terms of plane waves um, uh, of uh, this form. And by rotational invariance, so this is rotationally invariant, it should only depend on the magnitude of Q and the, the inner product between Q hat and P hat. So does that still make sense? So before we were looking at So before we were looking at the, the contribution to the density perturbation at position X from, from photons or from particles with momenta P hat. Now what we do is we Fourier transform this, and so we have some, uh, some wave crests, if you want. So there's, we're looking at uh, particles with given 
uh, direction. So all the particles here, so maybe you have some overdensity somewhere. So there's a direction p hat, and then you have uh, uh, the Fourier momentum that's uh, perpendicular to the to the plane wave. So you have a, a setup that looks like this uh, for the. So this is what the delta of q and q dot p hat. Uh, is, is describing. Does that make sense? So we're Fourier transforming the initial density perturbation, and we, we look at a given, given Fourier mode, which will be plane waves in some, in some direction. Does that make sense? Okay, and so then the, the reason I'm drawing it is because it will be kind of obvious what, this, what the solution uh, to this equation is. Um, the, the, so if you look at this, so the particles move in the p hat direction. If you have p hat uh, um, perpendicular to q, so if the particles move in, in this direction, then obviously this quantity doesn't evolve at all. They're all just moving along the, the wave crests. And this is what you're seeing here. When they're orthogonal, the mu, which I called q hat dot p hat, is just zero, and this quantity just doesn't evolve. Uh, on the other hand, if you have uh, them parallel, so you have q dot p parallel, then you just get one here. So you have a, a plane wave that goes like e to the uh, minus i q mu times t. This is the solution. And so you just, in the case where this becomes one, you just have a plane wave that's moving at the speed of light, which also makes sense because now the particles are moving in this direction. So you get these plane waves traveling at the speed of light. So these are the solutions of these equations. It's just describing these simple cases where you have these plane wave uh, solutions. So does that make sense? These are just the basic physics of the, the Fourier transform of these things. Okay, and so... Uh, what we're interested in is the, the temperature perturbation at some point in the, in the plasma looking out in some direction n hat. And this is just the one quarter we saw before. So it's just one quarter of, this is essentially delta rho over rho of the, of the plasma. And then you have, you're interested in it at the, at the origin, let's say, or where you're sitting. And you're interested in it not, uh, so p hat again is minus n hat, so the momentum of the photon is minus the, the direction you're looking. And what you can do, or what we're interested in for the CMB, as we said, are these uh, multiple coefficients. And so you uh, just uh, Fourier, uh, not Fourier, but you just uh, integrate against the spherical harmonics and you get um, multiple coefficients that look like this in terms of uh, these gadgets that are obtained from these ones by expanding in terms of Legendre polynomials. So does that all still make sense? There's a lot of gymnastics, but we'll eventually be interested in, uh, as you can see, these are useful because now if you take the angular power spectra, they're directly proportional to the delta TL squared. So these are really the, uh, the pieces, the underlying pieces in the, in the C sub L. So these are the quantities you actually want to compute. That's why I'm going through this gymnastics. And so uh, what we'll do next is just generalize this to the expanding universe and include interactions. But maybe I'll uh, stop. Well, let me show this one still. So you just plug this into the underlying equation. So we had a very simple equation to begin with. And then we Fourier transformed and we expanded this in terms of the Legendre polynomials. And uh, these guys satisfy a, a system of equations. The reason they're coupled is from the Q mu term that I was just describing to you uh, a second ago on the previous slide. So there's this Q mu which will couple the, the different um, pieces. And so you get a system of uh, coupled uh, differential equations, and these are called the, the Boltzmann hierarchy, and we'll extend it to the uh, a case where you have perturbations in the, in the metric, so in, a, in an expanding universe, and to include uh, interaction. So I, I think maybe I'll, I'll stop here, and then we continue with that in the next lecture. Oh, thanks.